thank you very much to the organisers for uh, inviting me for a very impressive programme. Uh, so Biogen is, I guess, a large biotech uh, company and we focus in neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration and hematology. And I think uh, meetings like this, it's not unusual to see um, slides showing the rapid technological advances of next generation sequencing and how they've out outpaced Moore's law. Um, this isn't really the case for productivity in the pharmaceutical industry, such that the authors of this uh, review a couple of years ago called it E-Room's Law, which is the reverse of Moore's Law for the decreasing productivity. So since the 1950s, for every billion we put in, we get fewer drugs out. And I think we're really looking to precision medicine and the initiatives that we heard about this morning to reverse this trend. And the testament will really be our ability to develop improved therapies that really target mechanistically with an improved risk-benefit profile for patients. So you've just seen one pipeline, you'll probably see a few of these. Um, it's much more, this is a pharmaceutical pipeline, it's much more convoluted and complex than this a single straight arrow would suggest and there are many decisions to make along the way. But there are a few decisions that are far more critical than others. And I think the first one is what target are we going to work on? What do we believe is going to modulate the disease? And as our chemists have got better at developing highly selective, bioavailable, uh, safe compounds, it's often not until phase two and three that we realize that the target may not work in patients. The second decision then is which patients are we going to go into? And John Bell mentioned this. It is not uncommon in the pharmaceutical industry to take all comers with a clinical diagnosis without fully understanding what the underlying disease mechanism is for those patients. So we have these two uh, key decisions. And how does the industry, how has the industry been thinking about these? And these are two reports on the left hand side. Uh, some research by Surveying Pharma showing that actually a very small proportion of overall R&D spend goes on target selection and validation. For the patient piece, there's clearly, and this is a little bit old, it's a survey by Tufts, but there's clearly a lot of enthusiasm and investment in personalised and precision medicine across the industry. But this isn't always translating into good biomarkers and companion diagnostics. So thinking about the relatively small investment in target validation, which I think is somewhat inevitable given the huge cost of running large late phase trials, uh, how can we position ourselves to have a better chance of success when we're first thinking about those targets? So this is a figure that Dave Cook and Mene Pangalos and other colleagues from AstraZeneca put in a review a couple of years ago. And you know, being a geneticist, it's very reassuring to see that if your target originally has some compelling genetic data associated with it, it's more likely to succeed through phase two. What's nice about this study in particular is that they looked at several factors over several years of the pipeline and they also show in the same figure that having an efficacy biomarker is an important predictor of success. And I think we, it's intuitive to feel that um, having genetic evidence to, at the outset will help us define those efficacy biomarkers to take into the clinic. And that's really what we're looking to do in Biogen and several other industry is to get much more systematic about taking human genetic data and turning it into a, a meaningful clinical trial. Um, and this is not the drug discovery pipeline, but a pipeline, that, uh, a simplistic pipeline of how we think we might get to discovering new genetic loci to um, a clinical trial. And, at the discover loci end, the hard work of the genetics community and the genomics initiative we've heard about today means that we have thousands of statistically robustly associated loci with disease. It's uh, much fewer of those loci we understand what the responsible or causal gene is, and this is particularly the case for GWAS loci. And in even fewer cases do we really understand what the mechanism of action is of those DNA variants and those genes. 
and we need to understand the mechanism of action in order to formulate a pharmacological hypothesis. And so this red box here is our first bottleneck in the process from getting from long lists of gene loci to something that's actually actionable with a therapeutic agent. So what approaches can we take to um, triage things through this pipeline? And um, I think it's clear that as we understand the non-coding genome better and initiatives like the epigenome roadmap uh, and ENCODE, we will undoubtedly get much more insight into the non-coding genome and annotating many of those GWAS variants. But if you hang out for long enough with chemists like I do, you uh, learn that the protein is the most important molecule. Uh, and one area that we think is a much more direct link between a gene, genotype and phenotype is by finding coding variants because they can be tested in the laboratory for functional. So it's a much more direct link to mechanism. So um, I'm at Biogen, my boss, Tim Harris, and David Goldstein and colleagues put together a consortium to do exome sequencing in ALS, a, a motor neurone disease with no current therapies and a big interest of Biogen. Um, they looked at about 3,500 uh, cases and followed up the top hits uh, in a larger number of patients, and the paper was very recently <coughs> published in Science. So they reassuringly, I think, identified several of the loci that we already know are important in ALS, including SOD1 and C9 or 72. Um, but they also in, identified a new gene, TBK1, which is the tank binding kinase 1 gene. Uh, and this graphic here is taken from the picture, and it shows the distribution of uh, variants that were identified in this gene. The letter denotes the... Um, the type of variants, uh, the red circles are um, loss of function, and the red and blue lines denote whether they were seen in cases, controls, or both. And there's a highly statistical enrichment of loss of function and missense variants in the ALS cases. So what do we do with this information when we've got it? Well, this figure is also a figure from the paper. And we actually know something about the TBK1 gene. We already know that it is an interactor with optoneurin, which is a known ALS gene. Uh, and we are, at the moment, systematically working through each of those variants using a combination of gene editing uh, and iPS cell type technologies to understand what the functional impact is in model systems that we care about. It just so happens, though, that uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was another publication in Nature and Neuroscience from a, a group at the Helmholtz showing that, these, that this gene is also important in familial ALS. Uh, and they've already done some work on the um, mutations. And, and what's of interest, I think, is that they show that the disruption of the phosphorylation of optoneurin is sufficient, they think, to cause ALS, as in their mutations or some of them, the phosphorylation of um, IRF3 is preserved. And I think when we think about pharmacology, this is the sort of information that's really important to us. Because if we know where in this pathway we need to intervene in terms of the disease-specific mutations, then we get a better chance of efficacy. And we may also be sparing for safety. Because if we know we don't need to hit IRF3, we can design molecules that don't hit IRF3. So, in addition to um, the improved ability to really understand the impact of protein coding variants, uh, we also want to know what's going on in the human population at large. And Biogen is interested in neurodegeneration. Uh, and this variant here is one of the two SNPs that you need to call your APOE type, the APOE type. So we know that it's. Um, associated with Alzheimer's disease. And then we can start exploring the large cohort studies to see what the impact is at, at a phenotypic level. And this has often been coined uh, the term FIWAS, or phenome-wide association studies. And we are working with 23andMe. And if you look in the 23andMe database, it's perhaps not surprising that variants that influence the risk of Alzheimer's also influence the risk of um, 
living to 90 and also uh, being a healthy old person. Healthy old here is described as being 65 and reporting no chronic disease. I think describing old as 65 may be influenced by the age demographic of the, uh, of the 23andMe workforce. Um, so also, it happens to influence whether you're a sound sleeper or not. And looking in these larger databases where all of the phenotype and genotype data is in the same place gives us the opportunity to really explore what might be pleiotropic and what might be confounding where we see multiple associations with phenotypes. In much smaller number of samples, you can get much more um, elegant information. So the Alzheimer's Disease Initiative have looked in a small number of hundreds of patients and shown associations with biomarkers that would be important to us in clinical trials. So we then move on to the target um, what, what's the next bottleneck? And I think that I've often taken uh, things to my chemist colleagues and said, uh, I think I've got a great target. And they say, no, you haven't. It's not druggable. Uh, and so how do we would you increase the world of things that we can actually make medicines to? And uh, at Biogen, we're working with uh, ISIS, the biotech company, to um, develop uh, a therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, which is a leading cause of uh, mortality in the US. And um, it can be fatal or it can have a mild disease course. The reason for the disease causes, it's caused by a loss of SMN1 gene, but the SMN2 gene here can partly compensate, and this is a copy number gene, so the more copies you have of SMN2, the more uh, you can con con compensate in the mouth of the disease. The SMN2 gene makes the SMN1 protein, but it splices out exon 7, and so the uh, therapy we have uh, leads the SM2 gene to include exon 7. And that's the therapeutic hypotheses. Uh, John Stavropoli and colleagues from Biogen have shown that it rescues uh, the mouse model. Uh, and the ASO does indeed make um, intact uh, transcript. And we've also, they've also shown that the earlier you intervene in the phenotype, the better the rescue. And this leads to not just thinking about the mechanism of the disease, but also the time. When should we be intervening? And that's led the group to work quite hard on developing assays for SMN1 deletion and SMN2 copy number to start in newborn screening programs and working with a number of US states to try and ensure that we can get to infants at a stage when they were most likely to benefit from these treatments. So finally then, I think the example I've just given is perhaps one of the most elegant examples of understanding that um, underlying mechanism, finding a novel modality to target that uh, mechanism, and having a clear um, route into the patients. But more generally, I think matching to patients is, is harder. We have uh, an extraordinary wealth of information about disease susceptibility. Uh, and we have uh, much less information about progression and response. Um, so as with the previous speaker from Tiva, uh, Biogen, one of the points on the slide was the MS market is crowded. One of the reasons for that is that we make five therapies, all approved for the treatment of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. They are all efficacious and population level have really transformed the lives of patients. However, at first diagnosis, <coughs> it's almost impossible to tell a patient whether they will still be playing tennis after 20 years or they'll be in a wheelchair after two years. And we have uh, started a, a, a lot of molecular work using our own clinical trials and with collaborators to really try and understand this disease progression in multiple sclerosis and understand how we can improve patient care. Um, one of the things we have done so far with pharmacogenomics and multiple uh, sclerosis is look for pharmacogenetic predictors of a rare adverse event, PML, which is caused by JC virus. Um, it occurs very rarely on patients taking that and losimab, and we thought that looking for genetics was reasonable given that there are a number of genetic variants that influence viral susceptibility. 
We have done genome-wide sequencing and exome sequencing in patients who have been exposed with uh, patients who have had uh, PML and are matched for all of the other risk factors and these are basically negative GWAS pots by SNP and by gene and we have not been able to find any predictors which are uh, either um, genome-wide significant if you want to call it that or I think more importantly anywhere near clinically useful. And I think the the thing about rare adverse events is they occur clearly very rarely within clinical trials and in order to really understand some of these things uh, it, it's an excellent approach for a consortium to take and I just wanted to um, give Arthur Holden who is the CEO of the International Serious Adverse Events Consortium uh, a mention. This consortium of which Munir may allude to in the next uh, talk has been hugely successful in building international networks to pull together large numbers of uh, cases of rare adverse events such that we really can start to do the genomic analyses. So to finish then, I think we really are at a tipping point in genomic medicine. We have um, clearly NGS technologies where we can measure not just DNA but RNA epigenomic factors. Uh, etc. We are actively using gene editing technologies to uh, explore the role of variants, uh, the large biobanks and bioresources with electronic medical records etc. Et are a great resource to go in and really understand the role of variants that we care about and I guess at some point we have to pull this all together with data science. Uh, I've actually only been at Biogen for less than a year, so the majority of the work that I've talked about today has been done by other people, and these are the other people, uh, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, their contribution, particularly my new boss, Tim Harris. Thank you very much.